Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything we feel like when it comes to the Beatles. Their years together, their solo years, um, their singles, their album cuts, their personal lives, what's going on in the news. We cover it all here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts known for my syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing, currently on about 50 radio stations. I also do another talk show podcast, which is called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which is also bi-weekly. And I have my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with Beatles content, plus my own website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, which has Beatles trivia and lots of interviews on there as well. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts here. First of all, a man who's been a fixture in New York radio for 40 years at WFUV, one of the great radio stations in the New York area that plays a lot of new music, a lot of new rock and classic rock, too. And uh, Darren has been there, like I said, 40 years, which is quite an accomplishment to be in this business, let alone at the same radio station. Uh, Darren, welcome aboard. No matter how hard they try to get rid of me, I ain't going anywhere. But thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken. Yeah, it's going to be 40 years of the first show. Uh, this FUV has changed so much through the years that there's some, you know, when we're talking about time at the station, well, it's 40 years since the first show, but 30 something years since this period at, at FUV and mm. this period. But uh, it's a long time and it's, I'm very fortunate, and thank you, and hello, everyone. Yeah, and if you ever want to check out, if you still want to investigate new music, new rock, there's good stuff that's out there, and WFEV is one. Oh, of plenty. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I enjoy listening to the station when I'm ever, whenever I'm in the car, especially. We also have Alan Cozen with us. Alan just recently finished part one of the McCartney Legacy book. Uh, co-authored with Adrian Sinclair, the much-heralded book uh, covering uh, the end of the Beatles through the end of 1973. He also has worked on Beatle books such as From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and for many years wrote for the classical department at the New York Times. He's a freelance writer, and he's always busy working on volume two of the McCartney Legacy. Alan, hello, hey, hello. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Um, sorry. And I was just saying hello to Darren, too. <laughs> hello. And hello to today. Out there in <laughs> hello. So, what do we have today, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> we are celebrating the brand new Ringo EP, Rewind Forward, which mm-hmm. just came out last Friday, October the 13th. Uh, on CD, 10-inch vinyl, and cassette. We'll be talking at length about Ringo's work on the EP. And we have and we have a very special guest to bring on to talk about his work with Ringo. And he's done extensive work with Ringo for many years. That's coming up in just a few moments. First, we have the latest in Beatle news. Uh, as I just said, Ringo's new EP, Rewind Forward, released last Friday. Um, also, we didn't get to talk about this since our last show. The biggest news of uh, last week, I believe, it was announced that there will be a box set coming out next summer for John Lennon's Mind Games album. Six CDs in the box set. Wow. And uh, all I know is if it's anywhere as good, anything close to as good as what the Lennon camp has done for Plastic Ono Band or Imagine, we're in for a treat. Um, still never got any word about sometime in New York City, but hey, I'll take anything at this point. And Mind <laughs> Games, we just did a show on Mind Games, and uh, it's my favorite John Lennon solo album, the most overlooked, I think, of his career. Glad to see that it will be getting deluxe treatment next summer. On John's birthday, a new deluxe and expanded version of Imagine the Ultimate Collection was made available to stream and download, uh, including the entire full-length collection of tracks, some previously only available on Blu-ray 
in high resolution stereo and spatial audio Dolby Atmos. Each set of mixes, including the ultimate mixes, elements, raw studio and outtakes is now being released as separate albums produced and curated by Yoko Ono. Now this Friday, October 20th, sees the release of Danny Harrison's new album, which is called Inner Standing, which comes out digitally. It will also be coming out as a two album neon uh, yellow vinyl edition, but that won't be until February the 9th. You can find a new album trailer for the album on YouTube. And on one of his dad's posts, George Harrison's posts, a fan wrote in asking for a Cloud9 box set. And Danny responded by saying, I know we're getting there. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Short and sweet. But at least it tells you that, you know, they are working behind the scenes. You know, we go for long stretches without hearing anything new. Thank you to Adam Webken for that information. Also, this Friday is the release of the Rolling Stones new album, Hackney Diamonds, which will have one track with Paul McCartney on bass called Bite Your Head Off. <laughs> now, how would you like to purchase Paul McCartney's legendary double-decker 1972 tour bus, which he and his band Wings took across Europe in the 70s? It will be going under the gavel at Julian's auctions next month and is expected to fetch between $200,000 and $300,000, according to the Rob Report. The bus is known for its psychedelic exterior, reflecting the colorful hippie style and free love attitudes of the era. Paul and his bandmates, Denny Lane, Henry McCullough, and Denny Sywell, used this bus to embark on their first tour in the summer of 1972. The bus carried them and their families more than 7,500 miles across nine European countries. The weathered bus was discovered a few years ago in Spain, and it was brought back to the UK. It has been meticulously restored at a workshop in Essex. The bus still features bunk beds, as it did back then, and it has an original trunk that drummer Denny Sywell donated. The upper deck, which was once home to bean bags, mattresses, and a playpen for the children, now folds down to become a mobile stage. The auction will take place at the Hard Rock Cafe in Nashville, Tennessee. That's November 16th through the 18th. The name of this auction is Julian's, quote, played, worn, and torn, rock and roll, iconic guitars, and memorabilia. End of quote. Julian's and the Hard Rock Cafe also offered a special contest to take a ticket to ride on the bus through stops in London with Rita Kelly as the tour guide. And they will hit Paul McCartney and Beatles landmark sites. But the contest ended last Friday. We only found out about all this a few days before this. On March the 18th of 1973, Paul and Wings became the first band to perform at the Hard Rock Cafe, Old Park Cafe in London. And this private tour's first stop will be at the Hard Rock Cafe Piccadilly Circus, where they will pick up the winners for this contest. The ride is supposed to happen today, October the 17th. That is some terrific idea to have Frida Kelly as your tour guide mm -hmm. going through Beatles sites and McCartney sites in london can i offer a couple of comments sure um first of all that hard rock cafe performance was actually wings london debut and it was performed the same night that the concert segment of james paul mccartney was recorded they then went to the hard rock cafe it was very late it was a they were having a uh a fundraiser concert that night and weren't sure whether wings would turn up at all but they did after filming the concert sequence for james paul mccartney um and uh in that in their set um they did long and winding road and um i think they had a couple of Beatles songs that were also in the set for james paul mccartney but weren't used at the show um, so that would have been, you know, if, if anybody has a tape of that concert, I'd love to hear that, uh, cause it's very unusual as wings concerts go. And the second thing is, um, McCartney legacy volume one is 
packed with information about that bus. Um, and the picture of Paul on the cover um, is we've taken him out and have him floating in this Red Sea, but um, he actually is leaning on that bus in the original picture, which is included in the, in the book itself. Um, but there's a, a ton of information. I mean, the bus um, only went something like 35 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, and there were a couple of concerts that they had to uh, abandon the bus and get flown to wherever it was or, uh, you know, just arrive too late for a sound check or, you know, the, the and the, the tour manager uh, just hated the idea of the bus, tried to talk him out of getting the bus because Paul had mm. this idea, we want a double decker bus to take us on this tour. And he said, no, please don't do that. And then it turned out to be going at the speed that it went, which was way too slow for a touring band. But um, yeah. anyway, it's all in there. Why didn't you try to get it fixed? Um, well, they did. Actually, they had, they had that bus completely reworked before they they took it. You know, it was a it was a a London bus, a municipal bus. They don't have to go that fast, you know. OK. I wonder how I wonder how if you buy it now and it's been reconditioned, I wonder if they've done anything about the speed or whether it still goes 35 miles an hour. Uh, I, I've I've oh, I pictured sort of I'm picturing the bus on the road and can't get the image of the uh, the van from the for those of you who've seen Little Miss Sunshine. Um you know where you they 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 can't they start the car up by running and pushing it till it gets to a certain speed. Then the engine will turn on and the horn won't go off. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I would <clears throat> I'd be very curious about the safety of the area on the top of the bus. Right, the top of the bus was turned into like you know like the sun deck. Yeah, uh, and I can't see being too comfortable and confident in my safety when I'm sunning myself on the top of a bus on a highway. But you're only going through I'm sure miles was... an hour. Well, that's true. It's not going to shake you off. <laughs> <laughs> not me, not my size. Anyway, that's <laughs> another story for another time. Well, it's on our Weight Watchers show. Mm -hmm. All right. But that's interesting, though. I mean, that was a busy day for Paul and the band. That first performance there. Mm -hmm. Very busy because uh, they, always... they, they played the concert for James Paul McCartney twice. They played the set twice before they, uh, yeah. So it was even where was that? Did you say where did that performance take place? Elstree, the... Elstree Studios. Mm. Yeah, it's it's I find it interesting. Someone like Paul, who you know, cares a lot about items from his past and wants to collect things on, on his own why wouldn't he want to keep something like this you know it's such a big part of his history the very start of wings the first tour you never know yeah. what he's interested yeah. in keeping and has and, no interest at that point he owned so much land in scotland that it would have been no big deal to just put up a garage to keep the bus in yep true all right. In our last show, we mentioned a GoFundMe page for Denny Lane. His wife, Elizabeth, said that Denny has had an illness in his lungs coming from a short bout with COVID. He's had three surgeries, most recently for a collapsed lung. He doesn't have any medical insurance. And we provided a link to the GoFundMe page. Now we hear that there will be a benefit concert for Denny which will take place November 27th at the Troubadour in West Hollywood, the famous Troubadour, with a star-studded cast of musicians, including other Wings members. That would be Denny Sywell and Lawrence Juber. Also performing will be Susanna Hoffs, Joey Molland, Peter Asher, Mickey Dolenz, Paul Schaefer, Jeremy Clyde, Albert Lee, great oldies band called The Criers, and the Denny Lane Band. Now, tickets went on sale for this on October the 8th. And I think what we'll do is provide you the link 
in our description box if there's still tickets available, if you still want to go to this to help Danny Lane out. Um, other news, May Pang's documentary, The Lost Weekend, A Love Story, was released digitally and on Blu-ray last Friday. Uh, the George Harrison Tribute, formerly Harry Fest, will be taking place this Saturday at White's in Westport, Massachusetts. You will have uh, musicians from the New England area performing George Harrison music and Beatle music. I will be there along with Boston radio legend for his Beatles show, Chachi LaPret, and I'll be conducting a conversation on George Harrison's solo career. Uh, that's this Saturday, again, at White's in Westport, Massachusetts. Uh, one other thing here, uh, there's a festival. It's been running for a few years now, Beatles on the Beach, which takes place in Delray Beach, Florida, January 24th through the 28th. The main headliner will be Cheap Trick, Big name right there. If you want more information about that, go to BeatlesOnTheBeach.com. I also want to let you know that Ken Womack, the first of his two books on Mal Evans, will be coming out November the 14th called Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans. And Ken and Gary Evans, Mal's son, are expected to appear for an interview and a conversation at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. And that'll be on November the 17th. We're hoping to have Ken on the show here to talk about uh, this book on Mal Evans. And also, we have to make mention of a couple of passings here. The first would be Jack Oliver, who was the president of Apple Records from 1969 through 71. Oliver joined Apple in 1967 and worked with Beatles publicist Derek Taylor before becoming head of the label. During this time, Oliver also managed Mary Hopkin. After the Beatles broke up, Oliver partnered with Peter Asher as part of a management and production firm. And later on in his career, Oliver produced concerts and tours for the Eagles, James Taylor, Carol King, Cat Stevens, and others. And from 1994 to 2001, Oliver was a personal advisor to actor Nicolas Cage. He also attended the Fest for Beatle fans in Los Angeles in 2014, and the New York Metro one, one of two that took place in Westchester. Uh, and the year for that uh, was 2015, when Jack Oliver was there. And in fact, Darren did interview Jack on stage. Mm -hmm. Share your memories of that. Yeah, that was that was that was a little nerve wracking being such a, a, an Apple person uh, when. They asked, I think I was asked there at during the weekend, would you mind interviewing Jack Oliver? Uh, he was a very nice, very soft-spoken man, um, very easy to talk to. And at that time, he was working on a movie about Apple. Not the one that I think was already out. Um, uh, it's, it's like a more than a two or three hour documentary on Apple that's been released that was out already jack was doing something different and i don't know i never heard after that weekend again about the status of his documentary hopefully it was finished maybe they're trying to find a way to release that but uh, another another player in the Beatles story has passed on so i was sad to see that i think it was i over, i saw tony bramwell had posted something about uh jack I think he was sick for a while. I was trying to get a sense of the situation, but um, one of my little, you know, small trophies in my mind of my career is getting to, you know, speak with him at the Fest for Beatle fans in 2015, you say it was, right? Um, so rest in peace, Jack. And hopefully that film, you know, was finished and is going to happen or at least is going to come out. All right. Thank you, Darren. Yeah, they've had so many incredible guests through the years at the fest. Uh, yeah. And um, sad news to hear about Jack Oliver. Um, also, we note the passing of Rudolph Isley, one of the founding members of the Isley Brothers. Beatles fans, of course, know that the Isley Brothers did Twist and Shout. Before the Beatles did. And uh, 
great version that they did as well. But they also recorded Shout, which the Beatles performed on the TV special of Around the Beatles. Uh, the Isley Brothers had many hits through the years and a long lasting career through the decades. Other hits such as This Old Heart of Mine, It's Your Thing, and Fight the Power. And uh, Rudolph passed away on October the 11th at 84 years old. All right. And that's all the news we have for you this time. And as we promised, we have a very special guest to welcome to our show this time. It's Bruce Sugar. And those of you who have followed Ringo Starr's career will know that his name is all over the place. He's been working with Ringo for quite a long time. He's been co-producing his albums uh, ever since Why Not in 2010. He actually started working with Ringo, I believe, on the Ringo Rama album going back that far. And um, in addition to that, he's engineered his albums. He's co-written songs with Ringo. He plays piano on a number of tracks. And we're, we're interviewing Bruce in part to celebrate the brand new EP that just came out last Friday, October 13th, Rewind Forward. And um, Bruce, it is such a pleasure to welcome you to Things We Said Today. Well, thanks for having me and uh, looking forward to uh, the show here today. Yeah, let's let's just start from the very beginning of how you came to work for Ringo. How did that all happen? Well, I th it was Ringo Rama was the first album I worked on. It was ha actually halfway completed at the time. Mm. And uh, actually, a good friend of mine, Jeff Silbar, who's a writer here in town that I've known for a long time, he was friends with Mark Hudson, who we all, you all know. Mm -hmm. And Mark was producing Ringo at the time, and he needed, uh, I guess his engineer at the time was working with uh, Aerosmith as well, and he had to go back to Boston to to finish something with Aerosmith. So he needed a guy to sit in, I thought, for like two or three sessions, you know. Mm. Uh, but uh, that was, what, almost 20 years ago, and <laughs> here we are today. So you never know what could happen. But, yeah, that was uh, my friend Jeff recommended me to mark and that's how i uh initially started working with rango and how were those initial sessions were you were you nervous what did he put you at ease was um i, I mean i was a little nervous i mean i grew up you know a little backstory i grew up playing drums hmm. that way back when and of course ringo was you know one of my idols back then and you know to all of a sudden get a call you know i was doing sessions here before but he was definitely the highest profile client i'd work with at the time so uh yeah no it was i wasn't nervous you know it's the same type of work i do but it was, it was exciting for sure yeah what got you interested in the production side of everything did you know that's what you ultimately wanted to do no i mean that's that's another long story because i actually went to university of colorado and have degrees in environmental conservation and city planning and, but I always played piano. I started as a kid playing piano and drums, and I always had music in in my past, you know. And uh, when I was in college, I met a, a friend of mine who wanted to build a remote recording studio. He was kind of independently wealthy, and he built a 24-track studio in his truck, in, in a truck, you know, to record live concerts. And the first gig I ever did as an as a assistant engineer was – the Little River Band at Red Rocks in Colorado. That's a good start right there. It is a good start. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so I mean, I've always had music in my life and I played before I started engineering and I never I never really went to engineering school, but I learned through building this uh, remote truck. And then after a few years, we moved to Nashville and I got a job at Quadraphonic Studios there. Hmm which is really where I learned most of what I know at, uh, in Nashville. <clears throat> just uh, just out of curiosity, since you started off playing the drums, did you ever play drums for Ringo? Did, he ever, did you ever play in front of him? And I did. You know, I, there's actually a clip. I, I, I don't know if I could share it now. I don't know where it is, but there's <laughs> a clip of me in England. Uh, well, this is when Mark Hudson was producing. He goes, yeah, Bruce, show Ringo you can play drums. <laughs> you know, so I was sitting at, and the kit was the uh, the kit from Let It Be. Uh, he had it set up at his house at that point, the, the maple kit. Yeah. 
And uh, so, yeah, I play. You know, that was definitely nerve wracking. But uh, Brent Carpenter, who's the videographer, actually captured it. So he has that uh, actual video. Hmm. Maybe I can send it to you after we're done and you can insert it in because it's pretty funny. Okay. Um, the way this works is we we all take turns asking you questions. And yeah, yeah. before I, I pass you over to Darren, I just want to ask a, a fairly simple question about the whole concept of EPs. And that is that, the, you know, with the exception of the first EP, which had five songs, all of Ringo's EPs have four songs. Is there any process that takes place when Ringo makes an EP? Does he does he get sent more than four songs and he has to pick what he feels is the best? Is, is there any set way that Ringo works when he puts these EPs together? Not really. It's kind of organic, you know. We, you know, we every time we do a new one, we kind of talk about who else we can involve, you know, because as you know, there's different people uh, produce tracks and stuff for him. So he, you know, he's basically just uh, reaching out to different folks. You know, this uh, new EP's got Mike Campbell on it, which he never worked with before. Right. So you know, we try to reach out to different people. There's no real, you know, we don't really look for songs or anything. It's just kind of friends we call and see who has what, you know. Obviously, with an EP, there's less content, so it's really not that hard to fill it up. Mm -hmm. And when Ringo first started doing this, part of the reason was because of COVID. Yeah, it's you know, the part of it was COVID. Part of it was just, uh, he just thought an album was just too much of a, a commitment in time. Mm-hmm. And he just, you know, I guess he likes putting them out quicker, you know, than mm. sitting on an album for for a year or two, you know. Well, how do you? I, I like it too because you know the it gets you know you put stuff out and then and each song has more importance than being on an album. That's true. Gets more attention this way, right? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to pass you over to Darren DeVivo. All right. All right. Oh, uh, that basically was my first question was the transition <clears throat> from albums to EPs for Ringo. Um, there are some musicians today who are kind of following suit or at least incorporating EPs with their albums. Uh, almost like the EP has the extra tracks that didn't make it onto the album or a handful of songs didn't fit the vibe of the album. So we'll put them out separately. But Ringo also did pass comment, I, I think, at the time where he looked at sales and he looked at who's buying and how, you know, if I'm going to put all this effort into a full length album and I'm only going to get so much back from it, might as well just concentrate on a smaller amount of songs and then put them out at a quicker pace. I mean, is that, you know, an accurate... I don't think that was part, part of his calculus. You know, he doesn't need the money, so I don't think yeah. it's... I don't think that's part of his calculus as far as these uh, EPs are breaking any records. You know, he, he's he got his fans. They do well, but, you know, compared to what's considered good for streaming now, it's pretty minimal, you know. <laughs> what keeps... What keeps Ringo... What, what, where does his drive come from? He's 83 years old. The majority... I shouldn't say the majority... Many veteran musicians have stopped making new music. They may still tour. Um, a handful will still put out new music regularly. Ringo seems to be the leader of that group. Where does his drive come from? You know, he just loves doing it. You know, he doesn't really have that many other hobbies, you know. And when he's home, he works out, you know, he, you know, he, uh, he does his artwork. He has an art studio he works in. So he just does it because he loves doing it. It passes the time. He gets to, you know, he doesn't go out in public much. So people come to his house and he gets to interact with other musicians, which he loves. You know, I, I think it's overall, he just loves the camaraderie. He loves the process of making records. He loves drumming. Uh, he doesn't love singing as much, but <laughs> yeah. He, he can get by, you know. I think he's actually singing pretty good now. Yeah, in fact, I think just some of the singing on this new EP is some of the strongest he's done in the, in, in a while. Yeah, no, it is. It's amazing. You know, it amazes me, you know, because he when he gets behind that mic, he puts his all into it, you know, and <laughs> doesn't hold back at all. 
And, right. Uh, yeah, he uh, he he is truly uh, an amazing person. You go see him, and you look at him on stage. You know, I'm in my late fifties, and I sometimes can't get out of the seat that I'm in in in, in the theater. Uh, because my knees are all stiff and I need help walking to the finding the men's room. Ringo's up there doing calisthenics on stage. And um, <laughs> is his energy when he's with friends and in a relaxed environment at home just as up? Absolutely. In fact, you know, we did actually had a session yesterday. On the, we're doing a new country EP. I think you've heard about it. And, you know, he's there cheering on whoever's playing, you know, standing up and dancing, you know, and, 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 and keep, you know, giving energy to whoever's performing uh, at that point. And he, you know, he's, he works out every day. He's got a trainer and, you know, a gym there and he's got, uh, you know, he eats really well. He's, you know, it's amazing. You know, he's really right. a, a great example of how to age gracefully and, and mm -hmm. you know, hmm. Well, it's I was kind of following your career, specifically working with Ringo. Is it safe to say that Ringo's the artist you've worked with the longest and the most in your career? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have a few people I've worked with that are a little less known. But you, yeah, you, he's definitely, uh, you know, most of the people I work with now I've met through him, you know, because right. networking through him is really a great thing as well if you if you if you follow and i have i forgot that you have been working for ringo now for some 20 years and that ringo rama was the very first album you were involved in but i'm following the trend and you started out simply as one of the engineers and it seemed with each album you were doing more uh and you almost have become ringo's jack of all trades uh when it comes to these sessions i mean i'm expecting one of these albums to have in here that uh, you did some interior decorating in the studio <laughs> at the time. Uh, as time went by, I mean, is it just a case where Ringo really felt more comfortable with you and adding on your responsibilities? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I started just engineering, obviously Mark Hudson was producer at that point. And then when he, uh, when him and Mark parted ways, we we well, why not was the first record we did right and uh we tried it out you know we tried it out and see what would happen and, and uh it's just evolved you know so you know he trusts me and you know he he i make it easy on him for his singing for sure you know uh i don't beat him up too much you know because <laughs> that's the thing that he doesn't like too much uh, uh and, and one more question regarding producing it seems that under, maybe with your guidance while working with you, um, Ringo came into his own as a producer himself. He never really produced himself, always had other people uh, do the heavy lifting. Now he does the heavy lifting. And it almost seems as though he learned from you and picked up, you know, some necessary. Well, I don't. I don't know if he learned from me, but he's worked with some of the greatest producers in the world over the years, you know, so he, he, he absorbs a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and he has great ideas, you know, mm -hmm. he's not, you know, uh, as musical as far as, uh, notation and, you know, he, he's not a school musician, so right. he doesn't know how to, uh, explain certain things, but he knows what he likes and, and he's pretty good at, uh, you know what? I, I kind of get into minutia as a producer and he looks at the big picture. So it works. We work together really well that way. All right. Alan, let's hear from you. OK. Um, I gather, I mean, these days, Ringo likes to record principally in his own home studio. Is is that basically right? And it is. Yeah, he does. In fact, we were talking about that yesterday because I, I don't like being in a big room with glass you know he was talking about how he doesn't like working in big studios anymore but uh i try to get him in there once in a while depending on the projects what is what is his studio like it's a guest house it's a converted guest house and uh we set up all the equipment in the main room and uh the bedroom is where he has the drums mm -hmm. and uh it's a small little room but it, 
<clears throat> it works. I mean, you can do a lot with a little bit now these days anyway. Sure. Yeah. We don't usually, you know, the thing, the thing we sacrifice is we don't usually record everyone at once. You know, it's, it's kind of piecemeal. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the old days, there'd be four or five people in the room playing and we work out the arrangement and that was it. Now, you know, I, I either me or whoever's doing the track works out the arrangement and adds a couple of things, MIDI or whatever, and then he'll play drums on it, which creates the feel of the track. Mm -hmm. And then we'll over to that. So is he just using Pro Tools on a, a Mac or something? And and uh... yeah, we're Pro Tools is pretty exclusively what I've been using for the last twenty years. Yeah, yeah. And we record everything in Pro Tools. Yeah, yeah. Does he have a a, a multi track board that everything goes through into the computer, or or is it less sophisticated? Uh, you don't even need. I mean, we have a we have like a Trident sixteen track board, which. Mm -hmm. You don't even need for Pro Tools. You just need two returns, really, to to monitor Pro Tools. You know, we have a lot of preamps and you know outboard preamps and stuff we use. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, like I said, we're not doing full sessions with four guys a, 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 at once. So mm -hmm. you know, the biggest uh, session we do is when we record as drums, is maybe ten or twelve tracks at a time. Uh huh. Um, um and. In some cases, and I think maybe on two tracks on this album, uh, people basically have sent him tracks that they've recorded in their studio. And then he just adds, what, the drums and vocals, I suppose. Yeah, three tracks. Shadows on the Wall uh, was uh, Steve Lukather and Joe Williams. They recorded that at uh -huh. Joe's studio. And they, they sent it to us, and we did uh, Ring Oak plays drums and sings on it. Feeling the sunlight, Paul did it at his studio, and then we added uh, we added guitar and I played a little piano on it as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Miss Jean song was all Mike Campbell. He we just Ringo just drummed on it and mm -hmm. sang it. So when people send tracks, is is it is it assumed that you might add more guitars and pianos and and whatever? No, not really. If it's well, you know, if it has everything it needs, we don't. But uh, once in a while. We want to add something to it. Mm -hmm. What is uh, is writing with him like? Uh, I usually come with an idea. And, uh, well, Rewind Forward, I actually had a song called Rewind. And I mentioned it to him. I said, you know, I have a song called Rewind. And he immediately said Forward. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so that kind of sparked the uh, that whole song, you know. And uh <laughs> And he's basically writing a lot of the lyrics of mm. that stuff. I, I do most of the music. I see. Uh, we kind of share on the lyric, but he came, you know, he comes up with, he's a really good lyricist, you know. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So when you brought Rewind, re what became Rewind forward to him, was did, did that have some lyrics or was it just an instrumental called Rewind for whatever reason? I had a few lyrics, but you know, we end up tweaking them. I end up getting rid of half most of my lyrics and then we play some with his or we collaborate on a lyric, you know. So, you know, it's definitely a collaboration, you know. And then, and then, you know, I'll go ahead and sing a demo for him just for a guide, but he uses his own phrasing and everything. So once he starts singing it, he makes it his own. Whoever sends ever anything, even if, you know, even Paul's song, you know, mm -hmm. Ringo sang it paul did a vocal on it to you know obviously to, as a guide right but he'll go ahead and do his own thing and use his own phrasing and so he he definitely makes it his own own song you know uh-huh hmm. so the songs that you've collaborated on with him uh really cover a a, a bunch of styles i mean there's you know pretty jazzy stuff on ep3 and um uh yeah, free or soul I, that's one of my favorites really uh, yeah kind of like that uh, that was a whole different thing for ringo to do right. a song like that uh-huh um was... and and how how easy is it to push him into something that's that's new for him like that you know he's open you know he's like i said he's done everything you can do in music you know mm -hmm. and 
if it's something that's a little challenging or a little different, he, he welcomes it. If if he you know if he feels it, if he, if it's something he doesn't feel, he's not going to do it. But you know, he goes by emotion and and feel. You know, that's that's his thing. You know, so he will he'll definitely uh, let you know if it's something that he could sing or not. You know. Yeah. Do you also have a and, song on the upcoming country album? I do. <laughs> I do. Can you tell us anything about it? Um, the country stuff will let wait till that uh, comes around because I'm not sure what's going to be final on that. You know, sometimes things change. Mm -hmm. but, is the uh, is the country EP the one with the T Bone Burnett's involved with? T Bone Burnett, you know Ringo. The the way it happened is Ringo. Uh, I guess he ran into T Bone at some event a couple months ago or six months ago. And he asked T Bone, "You got any songs?" You know, and he sent him a beautiful country song. It was just guitar vocal, and uh, Ringo said, "Yeah, it's great. Can you put a track together?" So T Bone sent us a track, beautiful track, and uh, that was the start of it. Yeah. So T Bone, T Bone was the uh, initial spark for that record. That's a four song EP. All the socks will be country. Yeah, they're all country. Yeah, we actually finished it up yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. Did some violin overdubs and some guitar. Great. So you know, I'm, I'm assuming 2024, probably. Yeah, it's probably going to be out the first or the end of the first or second quarter of next mm -hmm. year. Uh, we'll see. You know, you never know with the labels how you know, they. Mm -hmm. schedule stuff to be released for a lot of years ringo's fans have wanted him to make another country album ever since buku's of blues which wow. really, you know over the years people have respected the fact that ringo did an all-country album and i've even talked to people who have told me that people in the country field at that time recognized that album and he sprinkles a country song here and there on his albums and eps but it'd be nice to see him do well in this case at least we're getting four yeah yeah, yeah well so it's interesting to see how uh nashville relate to it two songs are real traditional country and two are kind of more modern country mm. but uh it'll be interesting to see how nashville he's definitely he's got a great voice for country you know there's no doubt about it so suitable for it yeah when he first talked about the three EPs that he was planning to do, he mentioned Linda Perry as though she was going to be the second EP. Was that, was work done on that yet? That one's still in the works. You know, uh, Linda got busy. You know, she's doing a bunch of stuff. I don't know. But uh, hers was supposed to be before the country one, but she got it held up. And now we're going to, you know, the country will come out first. And I imagine at some point hmm. she will do one. I think she's got, I think we maybe did two with her. I'm okay. not sure. I wasn't sure if this was going to be like uh, four tracks that Linda wrote. It's all her songs. Well, I think her EP will be four songs that she does, but that's not going to be out for probably after this country EP. Right. So you were just saying that Ringo adds a lot of lyrics. Is that his primary, the work that he does in the songwriting? Does he work more on lyrics than melody? Or Yeah, I mean, every once in a while when he's singing, he'll, you know, I'll play him the track, you know, the, the reference melody, and he'll come up with something on his own as well, which is, if it's better, I'll keep it, you know. So, yeah, he, he definitely contributes to the melodies, you know. I'll do all the tracks, you know, the, the musical part of it, but, you know laying down the beds and stuff uh-huh you he, free your soul which is a terrific track and when i heard it it's like wow this sounds like you're listening to a smooth jazz station yeah right <laughs> <laughs> you've got dave cause on there yeah you've got the acoustic guitarist um yeah. beautiful stuff he's playing um how did that whole thing start uh you know what i uh I just had it was actually a song that I had wrote a long time ago. Uh started. It wasn't finished at that point. And uh, you know, it was I just played it for him because we need, you know, we write like I said, we write one together on the each EP. 
and uh, he liked it. So we ended up finishing it up. But yeah, it was a, definitely a different direction for him. And I thought he pulled it off, you know. <laughs> you know, we want to put it up, pull it up, put it out if it didn't. I hear something like that and I want to hear him do more. <laughs> yeah. The- yeah, I wouldn't mind doing a little more, but you know, maybe we'll do a pseudo jazz record at some <laughs> point or an EP. You've done actually quite a lot variety wise style because you've done reggae with him. Yeah. You know, waiting for the tide to turn. You wrote that yeah. with him. And I yeah. know Ringo is really into reggae, right? Yeah. No, I love doing the reggae stuff. We did two songs. and uh, So, you know, it's just trying to keep it fresh, you know. You know, but... Um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a challenge to... Uh, with a four-song format to... Mm. You know, keep it... Keep, you know... Keep it fresh. Yeah. So I, I just want to mention, because we brought up Linda Perry, how did she become involved with Ringo in the first place? And there's one other person that you've written with, Sam Hollander, who's added a lot to... Uh, yeah, Sam's great. Is it Teach Me to Tango is a terrific track. Yeah, right. How did he get involved with Ringo? Uh, Sam got involved through his... I think his manager or attorney knew Ringo's attorney. So they hooked them up. And, uh, yeah, Sam's a great guy, you know. I didn't know what to make him at first, you know, these guys from New York and coming in, and he was kind of cocky, but uh, he delivers the goods. He's a really great songwriter. And uh, Linda, you know, at the time, like we, I was saying earlier, we were trying to look for different people to work with, you know. He he likes to reach out to different people. And uh I didn't really know Linda, but I had some mutual friends that worked with her, and uh, I worked with a, someone that she had worked with, so I, I kind of got a hold of her to uh, to contribute. Mm. And yeah, it's good. I, I love the coming undone that she did. It was a really great song, excellent song. Yeah, I'm going shorty. Yeah, you know that was funny on that track. Uh, the demo that Linda sent us, the the solo, she sang like a horn part. You know, she was like singing like being a trumpet player or a horn player. And uh, Ringo goes, let's get a trum, you know, we should put a real trombone on there. And uh, I don't know if you know Brent Carpenter, who's Ringo's uh, videographer. Anyway, he knew Trombone Shorty's manager. So we called him up and he, you know, I mean, that's one of the great things about working with Ringo, you know, you can basically dream of anyone you want to work with or put on a track and 99% of the times they'll, they'll say yes, you know, just to be part of it. And Trombone Shorty was great. You know? He, he uh, did his, not only did he do a solo, he did the whole horn arrangement on it. Hmm. Now that was a real treat. Definitely. Yeah, that was fun. All right, Darren, let's go back to you. Glad right. you mentioned Trombone Shorty because Ringo has always seemed to be open to working with and, and appreciating, appreciating the work of younger musicians, up and coming musicians, for example. And I can't off the top of my head because my brain doesn't work right anymore. <laughs> uh, I can't think of what song it was, but someone like Eric Burton from Black Pumas. Um, was involved in one of the recent songs on one here's of the, to the here's to the nights when we had here's to the night the Diane Warren song that had everyone in the right <laughs> you know and I saw that and I go that's very cool that like you know and I remember a video years ago when he used to do the videos on his on his uh either his website or his Facebook page and he was singing the praises of Robert Randolph and the family band All right. he was get, really getting into Robert Randolph at that time and uh, I appreciate the fact that he is tuned into what's what's happening today musically. Yes, yeah, he loves music and he listens. You know, he in fact, you know, you go in his office, he's got his computer there with his iTunes, and he has his playlists, and he listens to new stuff all the time. Uh, can you can you just randomly throw a few names out there off the top of your head of what you would what we might consider a new newish newer artist that he has said, listen, these guys are great or this artist is really cool, this songwriter. Anyone you can think of? Not really. I mean, well, I haven't really talked about it lately. 
Mm-hmm. Well, uh, it might be cool. You know, I mean, a lot of times you don't want to, you know, collaborate with someone just for the heck of doing it. You know, you got to have some kind of connection with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that wouldn't mind working with him. Yeah, right. How is Ringo when it comes to taking suggestions in the studios and accepting criticism? Should should that be necessary? Well, uh, I mean, you got to obviously. There's nothing to criticize about his drumming when he sits down on those drums. It's hard to come up with anything that's you know. Sometimes you might want him to do a different beat or something, but you know, it's magic when every time when he plays drums, you know. <laughs> His singing is a little more uh, forced and, and uh, you know, I, I don't really criticize him. I'll just say, can we do that again? You know, if it's something, I'm not going to say, well, you're singing out of tune or, you know, you're not in the pocket or I don't really criticize. I make it kind of easy on him, you know, mm-hmm. as far as that, you know, we'll do the process I use. I'll usually do like four tracks of, vo- you know, four passes of the lead vocal. And then I'll go home and comp that together. Mm-hmm. And then if we need to pick up another line here or there, he's he's always, you know, ready to do it. He doesn't right. want to do it. But is I, it, I make it easy for him, you know, because some guys sit there all day long and, you know, just working the death. And, you know, the guy's 83 years old. He's going to be singing for two hours straight. Right, right. Do, does he have a pattern that he likes to follow for most of his sessions, a way of working? Um Either it be a routine, a daily routine, length of the session, when it takes place, what gets worked on first. Um, is there a, 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 a regimen he sticks to, or is it every session a little different? It just they yeah, come together. A little, everything's a little different, you know. Bottom line, though, is we're not doing marathon sessions there by any means, you know. You know, usually uh, six to eight hour sessions long, you know. Yeah. Oh so yeah. Usually, you usually work like three or four hours, you know, he doesn't need to be in there all day. No, I mean, I, I mean, I would imagine that's enough time when you have your own studio, you know, uh, to just come and go as you please and work when you feel it. And Plus the people we're working with are so great. You know, usually it's usually they're talking more than recording, you know, and just interacting right. more right. than the action. You know, like, you, you know, you get someone like uh, Nathan Easton there. He's not going to take a lot of time <laughs> to play bass on something, you know. Right, right. Um, one of the real exciting things about this new EP was when we found out that Paul McCartney contributed a song. Uh, and Paul and Ringo don't work together as much as we'd all like. Uh, they've got their own careers, their own things going on, totally understandable. In a perfect world, there are Beatle fans who wish that they would unite as something... The new Beatles, I don't know. Um, yeah. so tell us the story of feeling the sunlight. Um, Paul, did Paul write it for Ringo? How did that song and Paul's involvement in this EP come about? Yeah, that was, uh, I think Ringo might have talked about it, that he was, you know, they, they're they actually really close, you know, when mm-hmm. the town will come over, they'll go to dinner or whatever. But uh, and they FaceTime a lot, so they were FaceTiming. And Ringo says, you know, I'm doing this new EP. We, you know, do you have any song? You know, he's asking Paul, do you have any songs, you know, that you're not using? Or can you write me one? And then Paul goes, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll write one. And I think this is, I think he, I'm pretty sure he wrote this recently, specifically for Ringo. Mm-hmm. And then he tracked it at his studio. You know, it's a full track, you know, with all the instruments that Paul played on it. Right. Uh, he he actually played drums on it too. And I think he's so Ringo he said he took them off. <laughs> and uh, uh, and, uh and, and and I have actually not, and this is one of the things I don't like about downloading and streaming music. I much prefer having a physical CD or LP in my hand. And yeah. I do not have a physical copy of the EP yet. I've been listening to the stream. Uh, so is is Paul playing almost everything on that track, feeling the sunlight? Paul plays everything but drums. Okay. And uh, there's an acoustic guitar, extra acoustic guitar, and I played piano on it. But Paul plays uh, 
bass, guitars, keyboards, zither, and backing vocals. <laughs> oh, zither. We haven't had a zither in pop music. In a while. Yeah, right. I know. <laughs> it's actually cool, that little party you played. Leave it, leave it, leave it. That's that's very cool. Now, um, when does Ringo, when you, I mean, you guys have, uh, you know, when a song is done, when it's time to stop tinkering with it, does Ringo have a like, all right, we're finished with this one. And if you feel like maybe you could use a little, you could use more zither. You could use more cowbell, Ringo. If Ringo feels it's done, is it is it, it that's it? Or will he say, all right, let's try one more take of whatever? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's, yeah. He, like I said earlier, he, he's good at seeing the big picture. So he knows when something's complete. But, you know, once in a while, like on this country EP, we're almost done recording it, but uh, he was on tour, and I said, "Look, when you get back, let's we need a couple little things." And he agreed, and we did it. You know, <laughs> you know, he doesn't get too uh, worried about the and the, you know the little bits and pieces. You know, <laughs> but he'll look at the big picture and oh no, when it's done. I mean, that's the hard thing about art, anyway. You know, when you're either when you're writing or producing a track or mixing you, you know when is it done you know that's the <laughs> hardest thing to to realize sometimes but he's he's really good about that and, and i'll ask one more question and then we'll hand i'll hand it to alan sure. uh and this i'm not sure if you could actually shed any light on this uh, but we did have mark rivera on uh, uh -huh. for two shows i think it was over the summer uh or, or perhaps the spring and we talked about Ringo when he plays live with the All Star Band, what songs he'll do and what songs he won't perform, and he does not seem to want to or like to perform any of the new songs that he's putting out, whether it had been on the albums up until What's My Name, and the EPs now. I think Anthem might have been maybe one of the most recent songs of his that he was still performing. I think there might have been maybe one more. He doesn't play his new songs live does that ever is there ever does ever come up in the conversation maybe amongst him and someone else about you should play this on the next tour Ringo well you know it was a pretty easy answer for that is <clears> that <throat> when Ringo's in concert <laughs> he'll say I'm gonna do a new song from my new EP and everyone goes to the bathroom <laughs> but Everything there are so many of us hardcore fans that want to hear well, I, you know, I wish he knew that because <laughs> because he, you know, the, the, his perception is whenever he plays something, you know, the, when he's playing, everyone wants to hear Yellow Submarine and Little Help and, you know, all his hits. So he was like, yeah, yeah anytime I do a new song, it's like, let's go to the, the swag line or whatever, you know. It's <laughs> like, and it's a shame because he's got some cool stuff that would be yeah. great. You know? What was the song, Ken? We talked about this and... Uh, is actually that would be an excellent show opener. I'm recent. There are two songs in particular that I'm baffled why he's never done live. We're on the road again. Yeah, that's it. Steve Lukather co-writes it. He's in the band. They're on the road. It rocks. <laughs> it would really yeah. work well with that band. And then Colin Hay wrote What's My Name? I mean, he says What's My Name at every single concert. He shouts it out to everybody. It just seems you know what? natural. They, they actually... We're thinking of doing What's My Name for this last tour. Uh -huh. And we tried working it up, man. It's 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 a hard song. There's a lot of lyrics in that song. And it's just physically hard to do. So I think that that uh, put an end to that. <laughs> if you look at the song, there's tons of lyrics, man. Mm. But that is a great song. I, I love that. that yeah. tune. But, you know, with every veteran act that's out there that tours, there's always going to be a segment of, of the people that go to see them that get up every time there's a new song. And right. the artists shouldn't take it personally. Some of them just don't want to learn new music. Right, exactly. Sometimes I think it's a mistake for the artist to say, this is from my new album. Just do it. Yeah, no, you're yeah. right. It's wonderful yeah. what it is. And if they like it, then Ringo will say, hey, if you like that, that's on my new album. <laughs> yeah, you know, he tries to work, you know, because of the, the new tour, I mean, the last tour, he just got off of, they worked out uh, Octopus's Garden, which he never did before, other than the Roundheads did it. But uh, 
Uh, so, you know, he's got other stuff that's more recognizable that hadn't been done, I think. Uh, but it would be good. He could probably work up one or two songs to add to his the shows, but I don't know. Yeah. We're not saying, you know, if, if he came up with an, uh, if he came up with a deal with the venues that when the new song came up, they locked the doors. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> 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 don't say anything let people find out when they're trying to get out yeah right we gotta we gotta listen that's one subtle way maybe yeah and anyway I don't, I don't really have much to do with the live stuff you know i once yeah. in a while they'll say we need to record a show and i'll do it but uh it's uh i'll leave that to the mark mark rivera is in charge of all mm -hmm. that mm-hmm this is almost a hobby horse for the three of us because it, it just, you know, we sort of grew up in, in the years when people would go on tour to promote an album <laughs> and would play the album or a lot of the stuff from the album, sometimes even before things came out, you know, and it was always right, cool, sure. cool hearing something new from a group that you loved, you know. Yeah. Um, now you you go to Ringo shows and this the old stuff is great, but it's always the old stuff. And, you know, yeah. Want to hear something? Well, I'll mention it to him, but uh, that'll change anything. I don't know if he has any plans on touring anymore, but maybe uh, <laughs> he'll probably get you know bored at some point and hmm. let's go out again. But he's he's obviously in good enough health to do it. But yeah, mm -hmm. he seems to enjoy it when he's doing it. I mean, you know, we see the videos coming in from basically all the shows, and he's he seems to be having a great time. He loves to be on stage, you know, the, the being on the road part, I don't think he loves too much, you know, being a, uh -huh. away from home, sleeping in a different bed. He's kind of, he's kind of has a pretty strict routine at home, you know, so I think it's harder for him to, to uh, adhere to that when he's on the road. Mm. Um, Presumably you, you heard the McCartney track when it came in, Feeling the Sunlight, um, and I'm just wondering how different Paul's drums are from Ringo, what Ringo ended up doing. Because I, uh, I think Paul's drumming tends to be more or less utilitarian, whereas, you know, Ringo... It's a, we, it's a lot stiffer. In fact, I think they might have quantized his drums. I'm not sure. It sounded mm. a little bit like a machine, but it wasn't. But uh, it was definitely, you know, he doesn't swing like Ringo does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he doesn't have that swing in his play, playing at all. Uh, Ringo always talks about crafting his drum parts to basically play off the vocal line in a way or, or, or the melody line, you know, to play the song, true. not just to play some noise. Um, and that's always been one of the things I think that have, has made his drumming so interesting through the years. Um, as someone who started off as a drummer, <laughs> What does it, uh, how, how is it for you to sort of watch him put together a drum line? Is it, is it illuminating? You know what? He doesn't put anything together. The thing that the, the may, I think mean, the magic with him, and I swear on this new EP, the most he did was two takes. Wow. And then I comp them together. And, and his, his, uh, just natural flow of how to play. And the first time you hear something is normally the best, you know, and, and it's amazing, man. He he just he just kind of gets involved with the song and lets him uh the song envelope him and and he'll react to it. And and you know, if you make him do it more than two or three times, then it starts getting stiff. But that feel that you know, that just great feel that he has just comes right out. Hmm. It's amazing to see it because it's you know, I've recorded a lot of a lot of him drumming. I'm still every time I'm watching, I'm, I'm amazed. You know, it's it's truly, and I've worked with most of the great drummers here in L.A. You know, and, and uh, just his natural ability to play to a song is, is you know, without uh, question, one of the best. And also his technique how hard he hits the drums his internal balance of the drums is perfect because mm. you know back in the day they only had one or two mics so we had to know how hard you know so that part of you know nowadays there's you know 50 mics on a drum and some players aren't as uh good as with internal balance you know they hit their cymbals too hard or their snares too soft or 
whatever. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's uh, he's got all that going on. It's surprising that the stuff on this new EP was just a couple of takes. I mean, it's it, yeah, it's, he's a very musical guy. Very musical. Um, are there ever uh, more than four songs for one of these EPs? Are there ever things that he decides not to put on that that you've you know recorded and produced and just hold it? You know, we haven't done too many of those. Back when we were doing albums, there was a few songs. He he generally just picks some songs, we don't, and that's it. I don't think there was any outtakes from any of these EPs. Mm -hmm. You know, he just, you know, when some when someone sends him a song and he likes it, we do it. And that's it, you know. But I know some people spend a lot more time uh, re recording some songs that they don't use, you know, but we hadn't really done that. There might have been a few we should have left off, but you know, that's you know debatable. Okay, um, you recorded his live album at the Ryman Theater, I think, too, right? Did, I did. Uh, it, was, it was, um, was something like that, you know, where is he's he's on tour, he has a pretty, uh, thoroughly rehearsed show and, and you know timed and everything, and uh, it, it, but from your perspective recording it were there any difficulties or problems or anything that needed to be overcome uh in putting that together uh not really you know i started out in remote recording i, I actually love it you know because it's you get the excitement of a live performance and you have the uh control of a studio you know and the rhyming you know nowadays most artists when they do something live they'll just take a feed off the board and pro tools and but the Ryman has their own control room and stuff mm. a separate control room to record you know and uh, that, to me that was the best uh the best all-star recording that i have done you know mm -hmm. and the video is great too I, I thought that was just a great show but i love doing i love live recording and uh and you know doing it the Ryman, which they're used to doing it all the time makes it easy you know Sometimes it's back in the day, it was harder when you had to, you know, bring up, you know, rolling a truck and you had to run your, all the cables and, you know, so it was a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Was that why the Ryman was chosen as the venue to record this? Because they had their own control room and in, in all of those facilities? Uh, you know what? I'm not sure. I, I don't know who made that decision to, to do it. To do it. I think Rango just always loved Rango at the Ryman. You know, he's just wanted right? the okay. way it sounds. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to do it in there. Uh, so yeah, that was definitely that. And that room just sounds great too. You know, I usually put uh, mics out in the crowds and stuff, and usually during the songs, I pull them way down because they don't sound that good. But the rhyming sounded great. You know, the, mm -hmm. the ambience of the room itself. Yeah, sure. It's fantastic. Um, do you sometimes go out with him on the All Star tours as well, and and record nah, shows not unless they? Excuse me. Not unless they need something recorded mm, okay but uh yeah i don't uh i don't do it you wouldn't join the also band like it's the zither player yeah right I, i'm not an all-star though you gotta be you, know, <laughs> you gotta have you know you hit the all-star band well if can, you can only, i ask if you only play your stuff live in his shows then it could be you know you'd have the hits yeah <laughs> yeah there you go maybe Darren? Yeah, I was going to say, Bruce, can you talk about, you know, some of the some of your achievements outside of working with Rango, some of the accomplishments, some of the projects you've worked on that you're very proud of in your in your career, separate from the work with Rango? Well, I work with Joe Walsh a lot, and that's been a real fun thing with him. Uh, and I've also... Did a few records with Ozzy, which were fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he actually did a uh, an album called Undercover. That yeah, he covered a bunch of Beatles songs on, which was fun. We actually recorded and mixed uh, partially at Abbey Road, which is really a, a thrill for me as well. Sure. Uh, I've done I've done a lot of uh, recording of Latin artists in the past too. Pretty big artists. But they're not that known here in the states. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, TV, you know, in this industry, you got to be pretty uh, handy doing whatever, you know. So I've done right. TV work and commercials and some films here and there. That's film's kind of a specialized thing, but I've done a few few films that were fun. I did uh, mm-hmm. some music for a film called Natural Born Killers, which was fun. That was a, a good project. Um, and you have your own studio, right? You Yeah. Well, I, it's not a full studio. It's like a mix room. Okay. Uh, I don't have anyone over here. I just mix here and do my do Pro Tools editing and uh there's no big studios out here. Okay. Any any you have anything else, Ken? Oh yeah, just a few uh uh important questions, at least for me. Um okay. you when you study Ringo's career one of the things that i'm so fascinated with one of the biggest changes in him is his growth as a songwriter and yes in the 70s he wrote a few songs with george harrison you wrote a lot with vinnie poncia time came with uh joe walsh on the old wave album then the mark hudson period and then after mark hudson there's all these different people that he's written with dave stewart richard marks van dyke parks Gary Burr, who's a great songwriter in his own right, Gary Nicholson, all these different people. How important is it to Ringo to be recognized as a songwriter? Uh, I'm not sure. You probably have to ask him that, you know. I think mainly, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I know he definitely contributes a lot to the songs, you know, and uh, it's probably pretty big, but I, I I wouldn't want to answer that. I don't know how it's, important it is to him. Almost every single song is a co-write with Ringo. Right. So it's a huge change right there. Yeah. So I've been so impressed with all the writing that he's that he's done that I just wanted to know how important it was to him. So well, you know, after Mark after Mark uh that era uh ended, he started collaborating with different writers. You know, they just come over to his place and he just, you know, made an effort to reach out to a lot of his songwriter friends. And and he usually had a title or, or sometimes some of that stuff, like the first album, we we did a bunch of tracks together. And he'd play a track for someone and they end up writing to that. And he, like I said, he always contributed lyrics or titles or whatever, you know. I remember him talking about why not that way. And, and it reminded me, uh, Paul Simon talked about his album rhythm of the saints that he would have all these tracks and then he would build over the tracks and write songs around it so it I, made me think of that <laughs> when ringo described it the first one he did was cecilia did, have you ever heard that story no Paul simon yeah that you know that you know the song cecilia uh, yep. yeah so he uh i guess they were all, all you know yep. sitting around drinking you know doing whatever and they were doing like a rhythm uh, rhythm section. They had they were banging on pans and congas and whatever, and they recorded a bunch of that. And that was like the first time they heard it, and then they looped it. And then he wrote a song, wrote Cecilia to that. That was yeah. one of the first kind of loops that people wrote to, you know. Back. Incredible what gives you inspiration like that. Yeah, so. it really is. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you was, how involved does Ringo get with the sound of his drums not just the playing because you know from the beetle days all the inventions that were done and, and all the different ways that they got different sounds whether it's loosening the heads putting the microphone inside the bass drum things like that um does he actually get involved with miking or or really the the different sounds out of his drums or does he leave it all up to you no, I mean the like I said, I do the minutia, hold it, look at the big picture. So if he hears something, he goes, you know, if the snare isn't bright enough or something, he'll mention something. Yeah, he he's definitely uh, attentive to that, uh-huh. but he doesn't get involved with the moving mics or any of that stuff, or you know, the microphone selection or. And he's got uh, Jeff Jonas who tunes his drums really well, uh, and uh, yeah, but you know, if he doesn't like. If, if he doesn't hear enough drums or the bass drums not punching enough, he'll, he'll definitely uh, say something. So he's he's aware of what, what his drums sound like. Uh huh. Um, one little thing: I heard that Ian Hunter was supposed to be 
on this EP, and I don't see him in the credits. You know what? I don't know where that picked. Well, you know, he mentions things, and people get the wrong impression. He was talking about uh, when he worked on the uh, uh, Miss Jean with Mike Campbell. He was saying that Ringo played drums on an Ian Hunter song that came out, and Mike Campbell was on it as well. So he was just mentioning that they were both on the same track, and that's why he thought of Mike Campbell. To, so some someone said, "Oh, all of a sudden, oh yeah, he he wrote it or was on it." And they also I read somewhere that they credited Ben Tench with writing Miss Jane, which he, he played piano on, but he, he didn't write it. It was Mike Campbell. Right. He did a sensational job, Ben Mont. Oh yeah, Mike's amazing. That last minute to minute and a half of what he's playing adds some. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike's really oh Ben Mont, yeah. They're both both amazing. You know, it was fun to have two of the heartbreakers on that record. Well, Ring, you know, we've worked with Ben Mon for a long time. Right. He's played on a lot of records with Ringos. So we all really enjoy the new EP and um yeah. Oh, yeah. Mighty on it. And uh I I love the title track more and more, and I love the message in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you guys have any more questions left you want to ask? All I want to say, basically, is I think this is the best of the EP so far. I think so, too. And it's some, it's, it's some of the m more aggressive music. You know, I don't mean that, that like, you know, it's a, it's a speed metal EP from right. Ringo. Mm -hmm. But it is the most, I don't know if that was the intention going in or just how it came about once you were done. Uh, but it is, you know, got some of the most aggressive playing and singing that I've heard in a while from Ringo. And, he, you know, as I'm listening to it going, all right, he's really a freak of nature. He is not 83. <laughs> <can't>. <laughs> right. Because he's even on his records now, he's going younger. But um, no, I just wanted to say that. And thank you for, you know, being uh, one of the people that, uh, that keeps Ringo going for all of us and is part of uh, this great mu musical legacy. Okay, well, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm amazed too every day. You know, the guy's got unlimited energy. He's enthusiastic as ever about making music. You know, it gives us all hope for growing older. <laughs> and we can still do it here. I just want to say how much I'm I'm enjoying this EP. Yeah. Um, another thing, Steve Lukather, what a gift. <laughs> Uh, I've loved watching him and Ringo's band for so long, and especially all all of his work with Toto. And I like the songs that he writes for Ringo. And now you got Mike Campbell contributing. I wish he'd do more for Ringo. Yeah, he may. You know? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> but yeah, these are all these are all teasers for songs. <laughs> it makes yeah, you right. want more and more. Yeah. Well, Lukather's uh, the best. You know, he's he literally is the best. I mean, he's the best studio guitar player that i've ever worked with and i've yeah. worked with a lot of them you know hmm. he's amazing yeah I'm really a player and he seems like he's a lot of fun to work with too he's a great guy you know there's no no ego again you know that's another great thing working with ringo he gets all these high profile guys in there but the egos go out the door when they walk in you know <laughs> never any any of that going on right great well, Bruce, thanks for spending time with us. Again, the new EP, Rewind Forward. You can get it not only on CD, but 10-inch vinyl, and also on cassette. All right. Look so thanks for all the great work you've been doing with Ringo. Keep it going. <laughs> all right. Appreciate you guys. Okay. This has been great, Bruce. Thank I'll you, Bruce. i put it up on my page as well. Uh, oh, from... wow. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks so much, Bruce. All right, good seeing you guys. And uh yeah, absolutely. We need more of it now. Yeah. Right. Really yeah. Yep. Talk soon. Wow, that was something really special. Bruce Sugar here with us talking about the work he's done with Ringo, uh, the new EP, Rewind Forward, and going back to his time from Ringo Rama on. And uh so many questions we had to to ask him, and he gave us he really delivered. And uh, what a great guest to have here on the show. That was fun. So now we get to talk about the EP, Rewind Forward, and our thoughts about it. 
And why don't we just talk about each song one at a time here? We'll start with Shadows on the Wall. And uh, Darren, what are your thoughts about it? It's such a great opening track, a driving pop rock song. Um, and it makes complete sense that Steve Lukather's one of the guys behind it. It's um, written by Steve and uh, his partner in uh, Toto. I think they're like the only two, maybe there's a third original member still keeping Toto alive, Joseph Williams. It sets the stage for the whole EP, which I made mention of um, in the interview with Bruce, that I think it's it's some of the most aggressive. And I don't mean that in that it's, you know, speed metal. It's 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 an aggressive, great driving rock song from Ringo. And the whole EP, I think, is the best EP that he's put out. And uh, uh, Pound for Pound, maybe the most enjoyable record he's made in a while. And it all, the stage is set with shadows on the wall. I mean, I don't know really what else to say. The lyrics uh, have a bit more substance to them than some of Ringo's other songs. Ringo sometimes does. I, lyrics aren't the most important thing in a Ringo Starr song. He's one of those artists where it's more the music, the beat, the rhythm, all of that. Less so the message, unless it's peace and love. But on Shadows on the Wall, uh, it kind of Ringo's veering away from the peace and love thing. And, um, you know, there's a there's a little a little more substance um, on that song. It's a great opener. It could have been the first single. Maybe it'll be. I don't know if they'll if today they'll even do a second single from a four song EP. Uh, but uh, really, when all is said and done with this whole EP. You could make the case that had this been. 30, 35 years ago, their candidates for, if not being a hit, at least being uh, a radio, you know, an FM radio hit. And Shadows on the Wall would be one of the ones to just to go with. It's it's a very strong opener. Hmm. You know how many times we could say that about Ringo? <laughs> from cuts from not only the, the four EPs, but his albums and his solo career. Yeah, because at the, the time, I mean, remember when Ringo was surrounding himself with the right people and it was the right team, uh, Ringo, we saw it happen in 73 and 74 was more than qualified and capable of coming up with hits and really preserving that Beatles sound without being accused of ripping himself off or ripping off the band. Mm -hmm. uh, that string of hits he had 73, 74 Un, really unsurpassed by any of the other four. I mean, the amount of hits, the hot chart topping. And so often songs that are on recent releases will remind me, boy, that would have worked on Goodnight Vienna, that song or something, and might have gotten some traction as a single back in the day. And today it's almost like our secret. It's an, it's an EP track or an album track that we're enjoying today different times sales aren't the same not many people listening uh like they were in the 70s am i making any sense here do you know where i'm going with this mm -hmm. or where i came from with this you've heard me talk and rant about radio and the state of radio and how things work with artists and as they get older because um the music industry caters to a younger demographic who buys most of the music they're not the only ones older people do it too but most of the record sales come from younger people whether it's physical sales or especially streaming these days and so as you get older the general feeling is in radio which has been the primary way to promote the music whether it's as important today is up to you um the people who program radio feel that these artists once they get to be a certain age or they've they've had their share of success their time is their time is gone they have their loyal fan base and they'll still buy the, the music, but younger people are not going to be as attracted to their newer stuff. So that music is not played on the formats of radio that target younger demographic audiences. So you take a song like Weight of the World. I always bring up Weight of the World. If Weight of the World came out in 1975, yeah. mm -hmm. it would have been a top 10 hit, maybe even number one. 
I mean, there's so many great songs he did with Mark Hudson, so much after Mark Hudson that could have been hits had they been released in the 70s. And you could say that about a lot of artists. You can say that about Paul. You know, how many times have you heard a song in the last few decades from Paul McCartney that you think would have been a hit if it was released in the 70s when radio stations really played him? Mm -hmm. Stations that played to a younger audience. You know, so, but that's my rant and I stand behind it. Mm -hmm. and that's how radio does work. Um, but uh, what you said about Shadows on the Wall, I agree with you. It's a really good EP opener and really sets the stage for the rest. I think all four songs flow very well uh, on this EP. Yeah. Uh, Shadows on the Wall was was the perfect choice to me. Alan? You know, I agree. And I also agree with what Darren said about this being his, the best of his EP so far. Um, it's it's a very energetic EP all around. And this is a great way to start it. Um, I noticed, uh, you know, the, the wordless vocal in the intro reminded me a little bit of the Stones' Let's Spend the Night Together. I don't know. <laughs> listen to it again and see if it still does. But um, but when I listened to it um, yesterday morning and, and this morning, it, it it just struck me as um, almost like a, a tip of the hat. I don't know if I don't know if Ringo hears it that way though, so maybe not. Mm. Um, great guitar playing in it um, by one of the co-writers. Um, it was interesting to hear Bruce Sugar say that that he's the best studio guitarist uh you know steve lukather uh that he's worked with um because the guitar sound on this track really struck me um even before the solo i mean just the guitar sound in the track um just sounded great and then two solos not bad ringo's voice sounds great and uh you know it's a it, it's a good song um the ending was a little weirdly inconclusive it seemed to me but the uh, fade in, the fade out the the end is kind of clipped. Yeah, it's cold. I love cold endings. Yeah, that's what I have to say about that one. Well, I I agree with uh, pretty much what you said there, Alan. I love the guitar work from Steve Lukather. It's really driving. Um, you know, the uh, on the other podcast show that I do, Talk More Talk, I pointed out that you know a lot of fans have kind of grown weary of. Ringo's peace and love message because it's in you know virtually every one of his songs and I think if that's what's important for Ringo to talk about then all the more power to him he should be honest with his fans and all that but when you you listen to these four tracks two of them have nothing to do with peace and love at all yeah yeah <laughs> and uh shadows on the wall is one of them and I do like the lyrics here which I'll read I see faces on the highway I don't hear a word that they say Somewhere that I know, down on the road, where the roses grow so tall, high and low, we come and go, like shadows on the wall. And then, I wonder if the faces see me. I've seen everything you could see. So you're traveling down the highway, and you're seeing these shadows on the wall, and you're wondering if they see you. It's like a different idea. Never heard Ringo ever sing about something like that. But then again, he didn't write the song, but it's something that's different. And I love the sound of Ringo's drums on that song. And really all throughout all four tracks as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Shadows on the Wall is a good a good song to open with. Um, and then we get to the song that Paul McCartney gave called Feeling the Sunlight. This time we'll start with Alan. I thought it was interesting that he said that he, that Bruce uh, Sugar said that he thought Paul wrote it specifically for Ringo. Uh, um, Paul's written quite a bunch of songs for Ringo over the years. And some of them have been written specifically for Ringo. Some of them, he may have had Ringo vaguely in mind, but decided to give it to him or not give it to him. I mean, for instance, Let Him In was originally written with Ringo in mind, kind of, and then he decided he wanted it himself. Um, so he gave Ringo Pure Gold, which was written around the same time. Mm -hmm. um this is uh you know it's got all of those mccartney hallmarks it's uh tuneful you know one thing you one thing you can usually count on from paul is 
tunefulness. And, and it's, it's amazing at this point when, you know, especially you know, with you working through session after session in, in writing and in right now we're, we're just finishing off on London town. It's, it's amazing that this guy has written really hundreds of things and never runs out of ideas for melodies. It it just is, uh, it's, it's really an astonishing thing because sometimes, you know, you start, people start sounding the same. He doesn't really sound the same, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but also I think, you know, in, in terms of the, the upbeatness of the song, I think is written, you know, it's written in a style that's very amenable to Ringo. It suits his voice. It suits his style. It suits his personality. Um, you know, some of the lyrics about, you know, sunlight spreading my love all over the, all over the world and uh, gotta be sure everyone's having fun. I mean, th- that's, you know, sounds tailor written for Ringo, really. It's, it's just <laughs> this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it's different from shadows on the wall. So you get, you know, just in the first two tracks, you get some contrast, which is, important certainly it's important on an lp i don't know if it's quite as important on an ep because it's such a short span but um you know it's 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 always great when he does some variety as he did on the last ep too with the jazz track yeah so okay darren i actually wasn't crazy for the song on the first listen and the second listen then it all clicked and i mentioned this during the interview with Bruce that one of the reasons I don't like digital downloads or um, you don't have any information in front of you, I wasn't aware that that was the Paul McCartney song. It had slipped my mind until after I'd listened through the EP the first time. And then listening to it again, I'm like, oh, that's pretty typical Paul, that song. I did think to myself, well, you have a song called Feel the Sun. Now there's feel the sunlight. Um, but <laughs> Ken, I know you're going to probably disagree with me, and this is not really my opinion, but I have read through the years that on occasion when someone would give Ringo a song, it was sometimes a throwaway. Um, what's the uh, Eric Clapton contribution to Ringo's Rotogravure? This be called a song. This be called a song. Um, Cooking in the Kitchen of Love. John's song. Not one of John's stronger songs. Not horrible, but not one of his stronger songs. Uh, Feeling the Sunlight just seemed like, that's a very cool song. It's simple, but it's a very cool song. And I wonder if we might ever hear a ver- Paul's version of that on something in the future. Um, Paul plays on it, and, and Bruce um, verified that it's all Paul, except for the drums, which Ringo wiped and laid down his own drums, and they m- made some other uh, light overdubs to it, but a lot of it is a McCartney song, and it's just so refreshing to have a new bit of music that the two Beatles worked on together to have a Ringo EP with a Paul song, or if it was a new Paul album that Ringo played drums on a bunch of things, that's always nice. And um, I'm a little surprised there isn't more buzz about a brand new McCartney composition uh, turning up on a Ringo record. It's like the good old days. It's like the Ringo album, the good night Vienna album and Ringo's rotograph. You are aware that was common to have the uh, former bandmates giving a song to Ringo or playing on a session. And a little bit of that is happening here on Rewind Forward with Feeling the Sunlight. As strong of a song as it is, I don't think it's one of the best. I don't think it's amongst the best. I mean, there's four songs. Uh, but it is uh, a, a good example of how strong the CP is, that it might be in my book one, maybe the weakest of the four, and it's a strong song. Okay, well, it should be worth pointing pointing out that um, this is the first time since the Stop and Smell the Roses album that Paul wrote wrote a song and gave it to Ringo. Right. 
when we discussed this on Talk More Talk, I couldn't remember the name of the song, but there was a song that Paul and Ringo wrote together during the Time Takes Time sessions, which ended up not being released at all. And that was, I couldn't remember the title, but it's Angel in Disguise. And uh, there was a demo that Paul made that was sold at an auction a few years ago. And we heard part of the song. But um, as far as what has been released, you'd have to go all the way back to 1981 from Stop and Smell the Roses. Paul has appeared on Ringo's albums as a musician. But as far as what he's written for Ringo, you have to go back to the two songs that he wrote for Ringo on Stop and Smell the Roses being private property and attention. And I do think, Darren, that in just about every single case, whatever the Beatles have written for Ringo, they know how to write for Ringo. I mean, Cooking in the Kitchen of Love is probably the weakest of all the songs, but I do like pretty much all the songs that Paul gave to Ringo. Yeah. And George's work was stellar. Yeah, his personality. Ringo's personality a lot of times comes through these songs. Alan mentioned Let Him In. And I always forget that Paul had Ringo in mind when he wrote it. And you listen and you think about it and you go, yeah, I could see Ringo doing Let Him It, it has... Something about it is is Ringo. Same thing with um, uh, was it um, nobody told me or nobody told me that was milk and honey. John had that ready to go here, Ringo, uh, and that also had has Ringo's personality subtle, but it's in there. It's in the song, <clears throat> and ironically, Ringo did sing, "Let Him In." towards the end of uh, the song English Garden on Ringo Rama. He snuck that in at the end. Someone's knocking at the door. Someone's ringing the bell. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah. There you go. But I I actually really like Feeling the Sunlight. I'm not going to rate it compared to all the other songs that Paul wrote for Ringo. But it's really catchy. It's catchy pop. And like you said, Alan... The well has not run dry with him when it comes to com coming up with great melodies, great hooks. Um, and also, I should point out that not only is Bruce Sugar playing piano on it, but Steve Dudas plays acoustic guitar on it. Steve Dudas appears again. He's been kind of a mainstay, uh, you know, on uh, Ringo's albums and EPs since the Mark Hudson days. So it's nice to see Steve Dudas participating in a couple tracks here. Um Song is just about enjoying life, you know, feeling the sunlight, feeling okay, doing all right, sharing the love. There's uh, one verse that says, hey, you come out of the rain, dry yourself off and remember, don't complain. You know, don't worry about anything. Take it easy. Enjoy life. And that's what it's all about. One little tiny thing about feeling the sunlight, Ringo shouting out peace and love. It's almost like he was aware you know, a lot of these songs aren't necessarily peace and love. Uh, and it gives it a shout in the middle of feeling the sunlight. Peace and love. <laughs> he's got it. He's got it. I got to throw that in, Ringo. <laughs> All right. So why don't we talk about the title track, which is Rewind Forward. We'll start with Darren this time. And, and this is technically the first single, whatever that means today. Uh, first focus track. Uh, and probably the only focus track from um, from the EP. Uh, and what's really, really cool about it, it's a great song. Another one kind of cut from the same cloth uh, that Shadows on the Wall uh, came from. A driving rock song. Mm -hmm. And I just really like the fact that this is Ringo and his present-day right-hand man, Bruce Sugar. They wrote it. This isn't uh, Ringo getting help from a bunch of different people or uh, someone else writing it for him, but Ringo getting the credit. This is a very strong song on this EP, and it's Ringo's tune. And uh, the beginning of it reminds me a little like Take Me Home from Phil Collins, uh, mm -hmm. the introduction. Um, but as the song kicks in and you hit the... And, and you hit the... Um, you hit that part that makes you go like this. I can't think of the word. You hit this part of the song. It reminds me a lot of Weight of the World, this one. 
that that sort of tempo, that pace, that energy. Mm. Um, so you know, it it just fits right in with this this driving this driving vibe that is all, that goes throughout these four songs. Okay, Alan, it's your turn. Okay, um, and we actually have talked about this one because when it first was you know put up digitally uh and the video was up um we i think we all went around and um uh i think i like it a bit more than i did then i i i didn't dislike it that much then but i i thought that certain things were a little bit oh ever so slightly hackneyed maybe but i i kind of like the idea of rewinding forward you know as as a, a ringoism it, it's sort of a a contradiction but you 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 understand what he means. I kind of like there's a this sort of like a, a a light electronic intro that I I kind of like that I don't remember you know being particularly taken by the first time I heard it before we spoke about it last. Um, I probably listened to it more carefully now. It has a a kind of easygoing Ringo rock groove going in it, um, which you know again it's 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 gentler than shadows on the wall and we haven't got to miss jean yet uh, uh but it uh you know it's a nice track it's um i like it you know it's uh you know it's fun it's like and it was a lot of ringo's things you know he used to say we don't want to break anybody's brains <laughs> you know <laughs> and it's you know a lot of his stuff sort of you know fills that it, it's just you know you listen to it it's nice you have a good time it's melodic you might whistle it later, uh, you know, but it's not necessarily a day in the life, you know, you, you're not going to um, ponder its deep meaning for years and years. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it has a good pace and uh, I, I, there's sort of a, a, a George-esque slide guitar in it um, that struck me and uh it's, you know, it's a good title track. It's a good first single. I probably would have released one of the others as, as a first single, but, or the single, as, as Darren says, what do you do with an EP, release all four? And Shadows just, on the Wall, I thought, would have been the other obvious pick do you as sing a first single, advanced track, whatever. Do singles even matter at this point? Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I love Rewind Forward now more than I ever have. I just love, like you said, the pace of it, Alan. Um, the chorus is is just so catchy. And yes, it's another positive message song from, from Ringo and Bruce Sugar. And um, I just think that the words in the chorus, they flow together so well. Mm -hmm. Very poetic. It's worth repeating here. Every day there's a new sun rising, rising up into the night. Every day there's a new horizon, everywhere another mountain to climb, every day another lesson to learn, everywhere another page to turn, reach for the stars, rewind forward. The um, the message in there is beautiful. It's like a lot of his other songs, but, you know, it just stays in my head so much, that chorus. Um, it's just really catchy. I love the guitar work in there, the George-esque kind of solo, yeah. probably mm -hmm. Walsh. And um, it's a really ripping guitar solo. I just wish it went on a little bit longer. I love Joe Walsh's guitar playing. Yeah, uh, you've got Matt Bissonette on there, who's who's uh, Greg's brother. Um, just toured with Elton John, by the way. Bruce Sugar plays keyboards on there. Um, I wish I had asked Bruce this question. Uh, backing vocals: Kip and Marky Lennon, spelled just like John Lennon. Anyone that, have any ideas as to where they're from? They're, uh, it's a family um, of vocalists, the, the Lennons. Um, they toured with Roger Waters when Roger Waters did The Wall, The Wall Live. Uh, I believe they're from California. And uh, I don't know if they do their own thing or are always supporting other musicians. But I think their fixture is out in California. So it makes sense that since Ringo's based in L.A. and Bruce Sugar is in L.A. that, you know, that these guys would contribute, you know, to the to uh, this EP. So it's um, uh, cousin Pat and Kip are cousins. 
and there's a brother involved, the Lennon brothers. So that's that's who they are. Okay, kind of ironic though. A couple of Lennons on there, but uh, rewind forward. Excellent track to Good me. Song, great song. Yeah. Okay, so we move on to the final song, which is Miss Jean, which was written by Mike Campbell of of the Heartbreakers, and. Um, I know on my other show there on Talk More Talk, they were raving about this one. So let's hear what you guys have to say. We'll start with Alan. Yeah, I think in some ways I like this the best on this EP, yeah. just because it is an outlier uh, in in Ringo's output in a way. I mean, it's if you thought that um, Shadows on the Wall was a great rocky track for him to start. This is like even more and yeah. it's a great closer. And uh, it has Ringo doing this sort of more, more shouted style of singing. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to describe it. I, I, it, it sounds negative, but I don't mean it negative, you know, uh, certain, uh, you know, blues shouters and rock shouters, you know, it's, it's a certain style of singing um, that he doesn't usually do. And it's, you know, and then when you think of him being an 83 year old man doing this um, and in tune and sounding good, um, it's, you know, it's just a, a great track and uh, it's a little riffy, but that's the style of this kind of track. And uh, I think it hangs together really well. Great closer for the EP would be a great closer <laughs> if he did a whole album. Yep. I can think of several people that wish that Mike Campbell would do more work with Ringo now. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, Darren? Mike Campbell, candidate for a future All-Star band. Okay. If so, you listen, if you listen to the two recent albums, Mike Mike's fronts a band now called the Dirty Knobs, and uh, evidently it was a band that Mike had as kind of a side project for years, but now that it appears Fleetwood Mac are done, and unfortunately Tom Petty's not with us anymore, it's become his priority. He's got two albums with the Dirty Knobs, and uh, Mike's a pretty good singer and sounds a lot like Tom Petty. And could do Heartbreaker songs in the All Star Band as the lead guitarist too. Um, and Miss Jean, I think it's my favorite of the four, like Alan. Um, and again, it's another example of here is eighty three year old Ringo Starr who does not have to be putting out new music. Most of the artists, I think it's safe to say, who are in a similar boat, don't put out new music. It's, you know, it's remarkable that we're talking to the new Rolling Stones album, if discounting their their covers, their blues album, Blue and Lonesome. This new album is the first new Stones album since 2005. Hmm. So most veteran artists aren't still making music, and we should be thankful that Ringo is and that he's doing stuff that has some teeth. And this whole EP, I mean, I was I keep saying driving pop song, driving, right? You know, um. Miss Jean is just like the cherry on top. Um, and, and and it's Mike Campbell powering it and Bruce Sugar kind of straight, uh, kind of set the record straight. Ian Hunter's not on it. Uh, ben Montench is, but Ben Montench did not co-write it. It's a Mike Campbell tune. And, uh, and it's an example of one of Ringo's better vocal performances in recent years, which you'll hear a couple of those moments on the CP and uh, the point is all driven home with this song, Miss Jean. Well, I certainly love it. It's a great way to close the EP. Um, I love that it is guitar riff heavy. It does have a heartbreakers feel to me anyway. <laughs> and um, just the whole performance we mentioned before Ben Montench, great piano playing on the song. And um, it's got a real heaviness to it as a rocker. Lyrically, there aren't too many lyrics in the song. It's about this mysterious woman, Miss Jean. And what does it mean, Miss Jean? Uh, great line in there. Here she comes again with that nothing but trouble grin. But uh, like there aren't too many lyrics there. But uh, it's a fun track. And um, like I said, all four tracks here, solid. One through yeah. four. 
Oh yeah. Uh, very enjoyable. And um, I, I noticed that you said, Darren, the first time you heard feeling the sunlight, you weren't that impressed. I got the same feeling, but after a the few first times, play, yeah, yeah, I was hooked on that. And um, of course, feeling the sunlight is, is also kind of reminiscent to me of maybe Good Day Sunshine. But uh, and I just uh, like I said, I love the whole arrangement of that song. The other things that Paul adds to the arrangement, um, there are these three descending notes that you hear when when he's singing. We're feeling the sunlight. Da da da. And then as the as he continues to sing, you hear da 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 throughout the song, you know, counter melody, these little things that add so much to the arrangement. Um, but all four songs are really just solid. Um and uh just makes me want want to hear the next one. <laughs> Which we now know will be the country EP. Right. Well, it's good to know based on Bruce, that it definitely will be four songs that are country music. So if you really crave that side of Ringo, that's definitely something that we will look forward to. His voice is just, well, it's not just Bukus of Blues when he does songs like Crying, you know? It's a so right. right for him, you know, for whatever the reason. His voice just seems to really match and, and work so well when it comes to country music. All right, so that's it for our review of these four songs. Rewind forward. Why don't we just very quickly tell the folks what we're up to? Darren, start with you. Well, you can listen to me on WFUV uh, Monday through Thursday night, starting 10 p.m., 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., and Saturdays 1 to 4. And you can listen if you're in the New York metro area at 90.7 FM. Or you can stream WFUV, WFUV.org. Or our app, we have an app, download that. These different ways to listen to the station. And um, FUV is a, um, a unique beast in the, the New York City market because we play so much new music and we really pride ourselves on uh, turning folks on to new artists, uh, new careers. Um, I always want to rattle off a bunch of names as an example. And, and, and I've come to the point now where I need to have a list in front of me because it's like I can't remember and I'm playing these artists every day. Hey, who are some of the big records you're playing right now, Darren? Oh. The new Black Pumas. So I mentioned them in the interview. The new Black Pumas single from their yeah. upcoming album. That's that's an example. There's one for you. Uh, oh, and Leve was an artist from Iceland. I thought of another. I'll stop now and um, look for me on Facebook also. Two Facebook pages. Darren DeVivo uh, or Darren DeVivo, WFUV broadcaster, Beatles podcaster, something like that. <laughs> You'll find. All right. Alan? Okay. You can reach me through Facebook um, at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. There also is a McCartney Legacy Facebook page. And we're I'm on twitter and on threads uh you can find us on twitter at at things we said fab we haven't got a threads page yet you can email all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com and uh, we try to answer if it requires an answer sometimes uh people send us great ideas which we uh, are always in the market for and sometimes take up and um yeah that's about it okay thank you alan if you want to reach me my email address is every little thing at att.net my other uh talk show podcast on the beatles called talk more talk a solo beatles video cast we just did a show where we reviewed rewind forward so if you want to hear more comments about these four songs you can join me along with uh, my co-host kid o'toole tom hunyadi and joe mayo for that show and we're on all the audio platforms and we have our own youtube channel talk more talk a solo beatles video cast please subscribe to that there's always my um my own youtube channel ken michaels radio with lots of interviews with people in the beatle world and fellow podcasters and beatles experts and Beatles authors 
And uh, please subscribe to that as well. Um, on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, you will find Beatles trivia on there. And you have a choice every time of picking one between uh, it's uh it's 10 prizes altogether it could be uh books cds dvds you pick one of the 10 and they're all beetle related beetles are solo and my newest prize is jude sutherland kessler's latest book on john lennon she is in the process of writing 10 books covering john lennon's life all in thorough detail this one is her fifth book called Shades of Life Part One. That's one of 10 prizes that are offered on uh, my website. Go to the Beatles Trivia and Games page at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Again, 10 prizes. You get to pick one of them and play along with Beatles Trivia every single week. All right. That about wraps things up for us. And uh, again, big thank you to Bruce Sugar for the yes. time with us to Absolutely. talk about his work with Ringo, uh, letting us learn a lot more about, um, you know, the work that's involved uh, with Ringo's albums and EPs. Uh, terrific guest to have on the show. Thank you, Bruce. So thanks yes. to all of you for watching. And for Alan and Darren, I'm Ken Michaels. And uh, saying peace and love. Rewind forward. <laughs>